identify this image. So this classification. So a classification was given on in which oral cavity was open and the structures of oral cavity was visible. And it was classified into class one, class two, class three, class four. And it was asked, what is this classification? Now, what were the options? Let us see. Malampati classification, Brodsky classification, Friedman classification, and Konmaklehane classification. Now, what is Malampati classification? Malampati classification is pre-anesthetic evaluation of predicting difficulty in intubation. And how do we do it? So many times in my video lectures, I have discussed the video lecture on pre-anesthetic evaluation in which I discussed the airway evaluation. I told you how to assess the malampati. We ask the patient, we sit in front of the patient. We ask the patient to open his mouth or, and take the tongue out, ah, ah. And then we peep inside his oral cavity and try to see the structures of oral cavity. If I'm able to see all the structures, I write malampati grade one, class one. If I miss one or two structures, class two. If I don't see the tip of uvula, only the base of uvula, class three. And only, let's say, hard palate, class four, right? And one and two, no difficulty because tongue is small in size. And three and four, there's a difficulty because tongue is bigger. So in first look, this image seems the malampati classification. But guys, I told you, how do we assess malampati? We ask the patient to open his mouth and take the tongue out. So this tongue has to come out of the oral cavity. Yes, this tongue has to protrude out of the oral cavity. And then we have to see the structures of oral cavity. So I don't know what exactly was in the image which is asked in the question. If the image had the tongue protruded out, how would we know the tongue is protruded out? By seeing whether the lower in the teeth are visible or not. Lower jaw, the teeth of the lower jaw is visible or not. If the teeth of the lower jaw is not visible, then the tongue is out, right? If the teeth of the lower jaw is visible, the tongue is in. If teeth is not visible, the tongue is out. So if tongue is out, then it is malampati classification, same. But if tongue is in, then it is not malampati classification. Then it would change. So then what would it become? It would become the third option, that is Friedman classification. You can see this. This is Friedman classification. Friedman classification. Where do we do Friedman classification? We do it in obstructive sleep apnea. We do it to grade whether the patient would have the obstructive sleep apnea or not, right? So it is done in the same way. The only difference in the Friedman classification is the tongue is not protruded outward. The tongue is not out. The tongue is not out. Okay. So if you see this image, comparing the malampati and the Friedman, the above one is malampati, class one, class two, class three, class four. This one is the malampati classification. Malam Patti, right? Why? The tongue is out. And the lower one is Friedman classification. So guys, if the question would have been very simple and Friedman classification would not have been in the option, then it was a very simple question, Malampati classification. But when Friedman classification is in the option, then you have to see the position of tongue. And if tongue is inside, then it is Friedman. And if it is protruding outside the oral cavity, then it is Malampati. Got my point? And Friedman classification is done in obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea. Okay? The second option was Brodsky classification. What is Brodsky classification? The tonsil, how much, uh, when we see the oral, inside the oral cavity, when we peep inside the oral cavity, how much the tonsil is visible, that is classified in Brodsky classification. Brodsky classification right you can see in the figure z let's say uh, class 0 tons tonsil has been surgically removed no tonsil in class 1 the tonsil is visible but it is hidden by the tonsillar pillars class 2 the tonsil is just up to tonsillar pillars class 3 the tonsil is uh, let's say crossing the tonsillar pillars and class 4 tonsil extend to midline Okay, now this is done to see the tonsillar hypertrophy. Tonsillar hyper, classify the tonsillar hypertrophy. Okay, and this is also used in obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea to predict the risk associated with obstructive sleep apnea. 
If tonsil is hypertrophied, again there would be a risk of obstructive sleep apnea. If tongue is big, again there would be a risk of uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So Brodsky classification and the Friedman classification is used in obstructive sleep apnea. Friedman to see the size of tongue and Brodsky to see the tonsillar hypertrophy. And Malampati classification is so many times we have discussed pre-anesthetic evaluation. Pre-anesthetic evaluation for predicting difficulty in intubation. Difficulty in intubation. Okay. Okay guys. You know, Malampati classification has also been used in obstructive sleep apnea, all right, to see the risk of obstructive sleep apnea. Got my point? The only thing, the difference, image of the two classification, the Malampati and the Friedman, is the position of tongue. Tongue out, it is Malampati. Tongue inside oral cavity, it is Friedman classification. So, I am leaving to you what was the image. If the image was the above one, it would be Malampati, the answer. And if the image was the below one, that is the tongue inside the oral cavity, it would be Friedman classification. And the last option, Konmak Lehane. Konmak Lehane is the classification to predict difficulty in intubation. It is laryngoscopic view of glottic opening. So, it is not the view of oral cavity. Rather, when we put laryngoscope inside the oral cavity and how much the glottic opening is visible, that is Konmak Lehane grading. So, it is laryngoscopic laryngoscopic view of glottic opening glottic opening right that is Conmac Lehane grading okay this was all first question an answer I have left to you whether it is Malampati or Friedman depends upon the position of tongue okay now next question what is the fluid of choice for surgery well in my chapter uh, that is uh, intraoperative fluid or perioperative fluid in the chapter perioperative fluid. I discussed two types of fluid, collide and crystalloid. Crystalloid, right? And colloid, I told you, we have natural, which is blood and blood product, and we have artificial, okay? And crystalloid, we discussed, is hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic, right? And this is how the crystalloid is divided. So, this question was a very, very basic and a simple question. I told you in that chapter that it is, it is nothing which is a better fluid, colloid or crystalloid. We always start with crystalloid. And once enough crystalloid is given, then we switch to colloid. So, what is the fluid of choice for surgery? So, we always start with crystalloid. There is no question of starting with colloid. We always start with crystalloid. And when a substantial amount of crystalloid has been given, then we go to colloid. So, answer has to be crystalloid. Blood is a colloid. Now, colloid is a colloid. And FFP is a natural colloid. Got my point? So, answer has to be crystalloid. Well, if this question would have been a little more difficult, if they would have tried to make it more difficult, they would have, let's say, asked in which crystalloid, which is the best uh, fluid of choice for surgery. So, I told you the crystalloid is divided into hypotonic, isotonic and hypertonic. The hypotonic crystalloid, that is 5% dextrose, etc., they are not used in perioperative period or intraoperative period because let's say the dextrose gets metabolized and then it becomes free water, does not remain in intravascular space. So, it cannot be used to maintaining the volume, intravascular volume, etc. So, it's not used. Hypertonic, that is 3% normal saline or 6% normal saline, they can be used because they are hypertonic, so they can pull the interstitial fluid into intravascular space, but they are not used routinely. Well, when a patient is in shock or something like that, then we can use them, but not routinely. What is routinely used? Isotonic. Isotonic fluids like normal saline, right? Normal saline and isotonic fluid like Ringer's lactate. Ringer's lactate. See, Ringer's lactate, if they ask the best fluid to be used in intraop condition, I would go for isotonic crystalloid and an isotonic crystalloid also Ringer's lactate. This is most physiological fluid, most physiological fluid. And this is the fluid of choice, right? Fluid of choice. And this is the fluid we start with. If this is not in the option, I would go for normal saline. 
right so remember isotonic crystalloid is the first fluid which we always use in intraop during surgery or during perioperative condition or in wards right so this is the best fluid to maintain the intravascular volume okay now coming on the third question again a very simple question which i have discussed so many time in my topic acls which of the following is not used in advanced cardiac life support system they have this time asked on drug they are always asking one question on acls and this time they had asked on drug which of the following is not a drug of acls now option a adrenaline option b amiodarone option c soda bicarb and option d high voltage defibrillator right so let us talk about acls advanced cardiac life support i told you management of of cardiac arrest in advanced cardiac life support system is divided into two depending upon the type of rhythm shockable and non shockable non shockable so we discussed in our topic acls in detail that shockable rhythms are ventricular fibrillation and pulseless ventricular tachycardia and non shockable rhythms are asystole and pulseless electrical activity so what are the intervention which we do in shockable rhythm apart from compression and ventilation so we do compression and ventilation that we give high quality compression ventilation and apart from in both we give compression and ventilation right what is the other thing apart from this we do in shockable rhythm the best thing the fastest thing which we can give which we can do is we can give a shock we can give we can defibrillate defibrillate so we can give a shock so we start with 120 joules we go up to 200 joules even even more than that right so we defibrillate the heart and try to make this rhythm into normal i mean we try to stop the heart by defibrillating the heart and then the heart will resume its normal rhythm it may become normal sinus rhythm apart from this compression ventilation and defibrillation the emergency drugs we use we use emergency drugs what are the emergency drugs which we use in shockable rhythm two important drug adrenaline and amiodarone right adrenaline and amiodarone adrenaline always 10 mg 1 in 10000 dilution we repeat every 3 to 5 minute we repeat every 3 to 5 minute amiodarone only two dose first 300 mg followed by 150 mg only two dose so these are the two emergency drug we use if i don't have amiodarone then i can use instead of amiodarone as an alternative i can use lidocaine lidocaine in dose 1 to 1.5 mg per kg body weight and then the half dose okay and if i see the rhythm as torsadis de pointis right i see the rhythm of the cardiac arrest that is pulseless ventricular tachy tachycardia as torsadis de pointis then we can give magnesium sulfate right which is the definitive management of that kind of rhythm now this two lidocaine and magnesium sulfate these are used only in specific condition if lid amiodarone is not there then lidocaine and magnesium sulfate in specific condition what are the two most important drug of managing the shockable rhythm adrenaline and amiodarone okay what about non shockable rhythm apart from compression and ventilation in non shockable rhythm we never defibrillate defibrillation is not done and in emergency drug the only one drug which we use is adrenaline only adrenaline no amiodarone no any other drug got my point so only adrenaline is what we are using in non shockable rhythm as the emergency drug got my point so in this question sodium bicarbonate is there the sodium bicarbonate is not the routine emergency drug of acls right so it has to be in the answer previously when the patient used to go into cardiac arrest people used to give all kind of drugs like calcium gluconate sodium bicarbonate and whatever used to atropine whatever used to come in their mind no nowadays the management is very specific and you have to follow the guideline and in the guideline there is no role of sodium bicarbonate okay so sodium bicarbonate 
is not used, let's say, in ACLS management. It's not used in ACLS management. Adrenaline is used, amiodarone is used, and defibrillation is used, as we have discussed. So answer has to be sodium bicarbonate. Got it?